What is an economy? Well, it depends on how you want to consider it, logically or historically. And why do I say that? Like any concept, there is an accepted definition that we typically find bandied about in the media and sometimes even in textbooks. And there is a more scientific definition that seeks to rid the concept of current or fashionable uses. Let's see what I mean by this. This is where historical, as well as political and economic history, come in highly useful. Indeed, as the economist John Maynard Keynes quipped in the 1930s, quote, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back, unquote. Well, we can say that the scribblings may reach back hundreds, even thousands of years. Just as a side note, if a physicist sought to dismiss modern theories on gravity, their attempts to put a rocket into space would fail, and all would shake their heads sadly. But if an economist recreated the scribblings of some academic and imposed them on a nation, few people would be literate enough to know whether the ideas would be useful or not. Indeed, like any subject, including the medical sciences, there is much wisdom to be found in older texts, and sometimes little wisdom to be found in modern texts, because fashions come and go. But the logic and validity of arguments stays the same. With that in mind, let's explore what is meant by an economy. The word economy derives from the Greek word oikos, house, and oikonomia, which is to do with household management. The nomia side of the word invokes law as in the principles or the rules of a discipline. Hence economics is about the principles of household management. This gives us a clue as to how the ancient Greeks conceived economic activity. It centred around the household as the unit of production, distribution, exchange and consumption. So what was the ancient Greek household like? It's worth thinking about this because the unit of our analysis in economics is always undergoing conceptual shifts and we may detect how similar our thinking remains at times. In ancient Athens, the household was an incorporation of the family following a line of descent through the male, the head of the household being termed the Kyrios, who had ultimate responsibility for the household. Control of the oikos would pass to a legitimate son on reaching adulthood the household also included the slaves and the land on which they lived. Women's roles in the oikos differed across the broad Hellenic area, but generally were subservient to the men's power and role. While the household has an element of the command economy, just like any household today distributing incomes to the bills, pocket money, savings, days out, clothing, etc., it also engaged in the marketplace to purchase the items the house was not producing. Periodically, the head of the household may also be involved in raids or wars and bring back booty, treasure, to supplement the household's assets and wealth. And so we see in the ancient Hellenic world a familiar pattern of political formation that we encounter in medieval Europe. The Kyrios becomes a thane, an earl, a king. The country becomes his family to which he and his advisers dukes, counts, earls and the like, coordinated the raising of monies and the distribution of resources such as land and the marriage of women as chattel of the elite to secure or maintain control over lands. Raids against neighbours, other kings' lands, added to the family wealth, and if lands were seized and held they could also add to the cash flow of the elite's coffers. Such raids might lead to permanent colonisation or control of tax flows which benefited the locally installed ducal authority and, of course, the monarch. The notion of the unit of an economy thus grew from the simple household, living side by side with other households, to a growing sense of what we call a nation, ruled by a monarch, England, France, Spain, Sweden, Hungary and so on, who also took on a paternal, or maternal in the case of a queen, regard to his subjects. The concept of the collective household to be managed by an authority persisted and persists in the sense that the political kingdom was the essential unit representing that notion of the household. By the early 17th century, for example, early economic thinkers such as Sir William Petty of the Royal Society were turning their heads to the imports and exports of goods. 
and so the concept of a balance of payments for the nation-state emerged, and the influx and outflux of monies for the kingdom as a whole, reflecting still the underlying assumption that the land of the English, and that of the conquered Welsh, was one unit under the direction or management of the king, or at least the thing to be taxed for palace building and wars. Whenever there were empires in history, the unit shifted from the provincial or national unit to an imperial centre overseeing the flows and distributions of wealth between the appointed overseers of the empire and the needs of the empire as a whole. In a return to imperial doctrines in which an empire becomes the unit, in recent decades a globalist movement seeks one single world government that has preferred to expand the collective household to the entire planet in which the nation-state is relegated to the equivalent of a county or a province. Nonetheless, for current purposes, the nation-state remains the dominant economic unit of macroeconomics that is considered in our economics. So we look at UK unemployment, German inflation, Japanese balance of payments and so on. But are these notions useful or logically impeccable? If we follow the Greeks down to national macroeconomics and to the globalist designs for one world government, we can note that the size of the economic unit is reflected in the centre of decision-making. The state, the royal family, whatever we call that centre, making the decisions that the old tribal or early household forms of distribution may have deployed. The main leader and his coterie being responsible for the decisions and distributions from the farms, the gathering or the pillaging and spoils of war. On the other hand, Early economists, notably in the 18th century, turned their attention to the actions of traders driven by selfish desires to improve their lot in life. By doing so, as Adam Smith famously summarised as the self-interest of the butcher or the baker to earn their money and in so doing helping the public interest by producing food. This alternative unit, the trader or the merchant, was gradually shorn of any psychological presumptions concerning people's motives dropping any critique of good and bad behaviour to a simplified notion that individual people chose their actions based on what they believed would improve their lot in life. By the end of the 19th century the unit had become the individual and we witnessed the rise of what is now known as methodological individualism to some economists or as microeconomics to others. This is what we learn about in the first unit presented on many economics courses. From this perspective, an economy becomes the sum of all the actions of individuals acting through many markets. Now, whether we draw conceptual boundaries around their village, their town, their nation, the continent, national state, empire, union or federation of nations becomes a rather arbitrary distinction relative to the logic of what economics is about. As any quick review of political boundaries over the centuries shows, Political entities are always in flux. Nations and empires come and go. Individuals do not. And much of the trade that they are engaged in is global. The only issue is that barriers to trade exist between nations for local political reasons and create diversions in how people trade. But such boundaries, we can emphasise, can alter. The logic of the acting individual does not. That means that a return to the individual as the starting place for economic activity is arguably more useful for understanding the principles. We can retain a respect for the collective national economy for pragmatic or useful reasons. For we also draw our attention to the current political situation to grasp how England's doing compared to Wales or the United Kingdom relative to France or in the United States how Texas is compared to California or New York let's say. But economics always begins with the individual making economic decisions about production, distribution and consumption, rather than the state. When a government enacts a policy, it has ramifications for the people within its jurisdiction, and thus individuals react according to their circumstances and their beliefs about their own betterment, such as the origin of economic logic. So, to take a summary from this perspective, an economy becomes a commonly understood unit of analysis that may encompass a nation or a federation of states. But ultimately, the source of all economic action is the individual person acting in hundreds of marketplaces. Thank you for listening and watching. 
Leave any comments you may have and please subscribe to the channel for more updates.